Imagine being so hooked on drugs that you don't even put down the laughing gas canister between breaths. Literally, all you breathe is laughing gas. That's on top of insane quantities of alcohol, cocaine, cannabis, and just about any other drug that you can get your hands on. Steve-O's story is one of addiction, despair, and tragedy, and ultimately also one of hope and life. You will not want to miss today's video. And ladies and gentlemen, if you click the link in the description, you can get access to a free video training that shows you how to address the root cause of 99% of drinking problems, something called the dark conditioning. I'm going to show you how you can reframe the way you view alcohol using my breakthrough method, and you can get access to that by clicking the link in the description. So definitely check that out after watching this video. Now, before he became one of the world's most famous stuntmen, the world simply knew him as Stephen Glover. Born in London, England in 1974, the young Stephen's family moved around a lot, as his father was an executive for a multinational company. He spent his childhood in various countries, including Brazil, Venezuela, Canada, and the US. From a young age, he got into skateboarding. Then when he was 15, his father brought a video camera home. Before long, Stephen had married Married his passion for skateboarding with his newfound love of the camera. The following years would see him filming himself non-stop doing skateboarding tricks and various other stunts. And he was also exposed to alcohol from a very young age. His mother was a problem drinker who struggled through several failed sobriety attempts. In interviews, he has described her abstaining for lengthy periods, only to then stay drunk for days or weeks on end. Sadly, she would eventually die a slow and agonizing death from an aneurysm, something which would haunt Steve-O for many years. After finishing school, in 1992, Steve enrolled at the University of Miami to study advertising. He quickly realized that this was not going to work out. He had been smoking cannabis for two years straight, and by that point, his use had gotten so bad that he couldn't even physically attend most classes. Aside from drinking and cannabis, he also took LSD though he experimented with pretty much anything he could get his hands on. He dropped out of university after one year, at which point he had decided that he wanted to make a career out of shooting crazy videos. And surprisingly, everyone he shared that plan with thought he was nuts, including his girlfriend at the time, who quickly dumped him. For the first three years after dropping out of college, Steve-O describes himself as homeless and in high gear, constantly filming stunts. Eventually, he heard about a private clown college without tuition fees and quickly applied. Yep, you heard that right, a clown college. After completing his training there, Steve-O worked as a clown for a flea market circus in Fort Lauderdale. Now, by that point, he was fully addicted to cocaine. His shows were on Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays, and by his own account, he would do cocaine non-stop and not sleep through those three days. Around this time, he was also hospitalized multiple times after harming himself whilst drunk. On one occasion, he fell headfirst from a balcony onto the concrete below, resulting in seven broken teeth. He was still in the cast from that fall when he got arrested for DUI. As a condition for his mother bailing him out of jail, he agreed to go to rehab. Unfortunately, the only reason he went was to make his mother happy, as he didn't even feel like he had a problem at the time. And the results were entirely predictable. Now, after sending TV producer Jeff Tremaine a video cassette of one of his stunts, Steve-O found himself starring alongside Johnny Knoxville in the 2000-2001 MTV reality series, Jackass. The show would only air for three short seasons, but went on to spawn a series of films, starting with the original Jackass, the movie. Of a tiny budget of $5 million, the movie would top the box office at its opening weekend, eventually grossing around $80 million worldwide. Three more installments would follow. The last one being 2022's Jackass Forever. All movies were major box office hits. Let's have a quick look at Steve-O from that original Jackass picture. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> go, keep going, Steve-O. Oh, shit. <laughs> Though he had become very wealthy and famous, not much had changed in terms of Steve-O's drug abuse and working hours. Things had actually gotten worse for one simple reason. Now that he had money, he could afford all the cocaine he wanted. Fueled by cocaine and working without sleep for days on end, he would then crash for up to two days in a row. By the time the crew of the original Jackass movie got together to film the sequel in 2006, Tremaine and Steve-O agreed that he would abstain from cocaine for the duration of filming. It was a promise that he would keep. 
He ended up staying a full year off cocaine before relapsing and picking up right where he had left off. Around this time, and before Jackass 2 was even released, his addiction to nitrous oxide, or laughing gas as it's more widely known, got really out of control. This stuff is legally sold, widely available, and has very powerful and short-lasting effects. Steve would go on to order cases of 600 whippets and inhale one of them after the other. He got so fast at changing the whippets and chaining them together that it got to the point where he, quote, wasn't even breathing air. In the midst of his most severe addictive spiral, he described showing up at the premiere of the Jackass sequel, feeling as if he were attending his own funeral. Amongst other fears, he was anxious that the Jackass franchise had reached his peak and it would all be downhill from there. After Jackass 2, as a way to stay in the spotlight, he tried to launch an unsuccessful rap career. This brought him in touch with the subculture that would only exacerbate his drinking and drug problems. He started to lose touch with his friends and family, often isolating himself in his home. Eventually, his drug abuse messed up so much that he started to chat with voices in his head and could hear his own thoughts out loud. And guys, you, you don't need to be a psychiatrist to see that these are extremely serious symptoms. And Steve-O was perilously close to an irreversibly bad ending. Looking back, he describes his state at the time as, quote, possessed by demons and very close to death. We're not going to show any of this footage, but it is freely available online. So if you feel like you can stomach it, go ahead and check it out. But be warned, some of it is very distressing. Now, following multiple arrests and public breakdowns, at one stage, Steve-O started sending suicidal emails to his friends and family. In March of 2008, Johnny Knoxville, Jeff Tremaine, and six other colleagues came to his home, picked him up, and took him in by force for a psychiatric evaluation. An initially planned 72 hours at the psychiatric department turned into two weeks. This was soon followed by a 30-day stay in a treatment center and two months at a sober living facility. But even though he managed to stay away from alcohol and drugs throughout all of this time, his motivation for wanting to change was a bit flawed. In interviews, he has talked about how he wanted to become a poster child for sobriety and an inspiration for other people. He also couldn't put the camera down and continued filming himself doing all sorts of silly things. After three months of sobriety, he felt depressed, worthless, and unsure about wanting to live. He voluntarily checked himself into another institution for several weeks. By that point, he was ready to come around to one big insight. He had to do this for himself and himself alone. Not for his friends, nor his family, his colleagues, society, none of it only for himself. He set the camera aside and became focused on his recovery, exceeding all expectations of those around him. In those early days, he was also aided in his recovery by a good old friend, the skateboard. Without alcohol, without drugs, just like when he was a child. He picked up the skateboard with a newfound enthusiasm. For the first time in years, he was having fun on his skateboard. Here's what he had to say in 2009, a few months into his sobriety. It was the guys... Um I filmed Jackass with that actually staged my intervention. So um, they've been there, uh, you know, in the good times and the bad. And uh, anybody that's not supportive of me staying sober obviously has to go. Right. Um, but on the other hand, uh, there's not really a lot of people that don't want me to stay sober. I mean, I was a nightmare. Like, I was a Especially in, in this town, there's so many people that will, will leech onto the celebrity just so they can kind of... Yeah. Yeah, I guess, like, you know, when you go through what I've been through, you find out who your friends are. And uh, I got some good friends, man. I'm really grateful. Looking back at his drinking, Steve was now grateful for the opportunity that it gave him to overcome adversity and become a better person. At 48 years of age, Steve could not possibly be a more changed man. Clean for 14 years, he meditates 40 minutes a day and is happily engaged to be married. He also runs a thriving business with a YouTube channel a podcast, and two very successful books. Now, if you click the video on the screen now, you can also learn how to stop drinking just like Bradley Cooper did.